Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's the Maxinadian Twinage guys with a brand new video. And uh, sorry if this is a bit all over the place. I am once again recording at like four in the morning. But this is a video that I wanted to, I wanted to talk about earlier in the week. Uh, usual, I kind of wanted to talk about it a little bit closer to when Debrinket was signed with the Red Wings. But things happened, and I wasn't able to get around to it. And now I figured uh, I may as well. So in this video, I want to take a look at and. Uh, I guess it's technically my preferred lines, but also what I believe will be close to Detroit's lineup this season. Because there's a lot of questions. There is quite a few questions where, you know, we, we signed, Detroit signed a lot of people in the offseason. A lot more than a lot of people think they should have because there are, you know, there's prospects that everybody wants in the lineup or believes will make will and should make the lineup so we're going to start with the forwards here and this first line shouldn't be much of a surprise Larkin, Raymond, to break it it's the bona fide first line Raymond should all signs point to him likely coming back you know he had a sophomore slump last season only scored 17 goals but this should he should be Raymond again this season and he, we know he's a potential 30-goal scorer. He has the potential to be a 30-goal, you know, 60, 70-point 70 70 guy. So if he can bounce back like I think and a lot of other people think he will, this top line will be a force. Because then you've got Larkin, your 1C. Yes, I cannot stress enough, Larkin is a 1C. He is going to be Detroit's 1C for probably the rest of most of his career with Detroit which will likely be his entire career. So you can stop with saying he's not a 1C because he was top, he, he was, I think, 17th ranked amongst all number one centers in the league. So he is a number one center, whether you like it or not. Number one center, true number one centers like McDavid or Crosby or fucking Stamkos, they don't just grow on trees. And Larkin is an incredible face-off guy. He's... Damn, he's pretty much a point per game guy due to injuries. He's never quite, he's only just barely missed it the last few seasons, last two seasons really. And a consistent, like I said, consistent 30 goal score, 30 plus goal scorer. So whether you like it or not, he is going to be your number one center for the foreseeable future. Unless, you know, Casper and Danielson come in and just blow up everything, which I doubt will happen. I love both Casper and Danielson, but neither of them are first line center potential. So. Well, they, everybody, yes, they are first-line center potential, but I don't believe they're going to be good enough to knock Larkin out of that spot. And then next, you've got Dabrinkit, the big boy, the goal scorer for Detroit. He has proven he can score 40 goals in the past. I know the whole, yeah, but he played with Kane, and Kane's one of the best playmakers in the league. Yes, Kane is one, if not the best playmaker in the entire league, but that doesn't change the fact that he was on a when he went to when he went to uh, Ottawa. I wanted to say Seattle, but that's not right. When he went to Ottawa, he did not get the playmates that you know he probably should have. You know he wasn't up there playing with Stutzloff every game. You know he had serviceable, I will say, serviceable line mates, but none of which played to his strengths, and none of it which were a good enough playmaker or playmakers really at all for Debrinket. And even with all that said, he was almost 30 goals. So if he, yes, he hit 27 goals. But if his floor is 27 goals, almost 30 on that Ottawa Senators team, imagine what he can do with Larkin. Because like it or not, Larkin's a playmaker. Larkin is a very good playmaker. And it showed. It showed this season. I mean, he got a lot out of the people that were up and down on the first line. You know, Perron helped with a lot of that. With I won't say a lot of it, but he helped a good deal with it, I will admit. Perron did a, de a pretty good amount of, of playmaking when he was on the top line. But that top line was pretty much consistent of Larkin, Raymond, and then, you know, someone, Kubelik, Perron, they swapped out. Rasmussen was up there at one point. So I believe this line... and. Debrinket can really bring could probably bring a lot out of Larkin too. Debrinket's no slouch when it comes to playmaking either. Yes, his defense le leaves a little to be desired, and you know his size doesn't help him much. 
but he's so skilled that it doesn't really matter. Plus, like I said, he is a very good playmaker in his own right. He's not just all offense, you know, nothing else. He is a really, really good playmaker. He, if you if you leave him alone on one side of the ice, he's either going to score or he's going to find somebody who has the who also can score. It's that's just how he plays his game. So this top this top line is going to be a force to be reckoned with. Realistically, yes, it's not the biggest first line. I mean, I think Raymond's what six foot, Larkin six foot one, Debrink at fucking five seven, five eight, some shit like that. So it's not a big first line at all. But you put them, you put two defensemen back there that'll get to, you know, it's going to work pretty decently. But then the second line is. I kind of went back and forth on it because it's a bit old. You know, like, I, I say old, but Cops, what, 28, 29, Sprong, I believe is 27, I think he's the same age as Larkin, Perron's mid-30s, but this is a good line. Cop is your 200-foot center playmaker. Perron is your 200-foot playmaker with goal-scoring upsides, and Sprung is your goal scorer. You know, these none, none of these guys are ever expected to be point-per-game players. So let's be realistic. Cops never scored more than 15 goals in his entire career. Uh, Sprung, his career season was 50-something points with Seattle last season. And Perron, while he's proved he can put up points, he's, you know, old. I, there's no other way to put it. He's old, and he's not going to be a point-per-game guy. I don't think he ever was a point-per-game guy in the first place. But Perron has a way with the puck where and his hockey IQ to where he can just find people. And he has a, he has a way of reading plays and, and especially protecting the puck. If you put the puck on his stick, he is going to either make something happen or he's going to keep that puck away from whoever's trying to get it from him while trying to make something happen. And then he will make something happen. Like I said, Cop, two, you don't sign him, and I cannot stress that enough. You did not, Eiserman does not, did not sign Cop for his goal scoring prowess. No, you don't sign Cop for his goal scoring prowess. He is a 200 foot defensive center who is incredible in the faceoffs. He, in my opinion, is one of the best faceoff guys in the league. First line center, no, and arguably barely a second line center. He's basically a second line center by, you know, need. So he's serviceable in, you know, two line center spot, and you can move him to the wing if need be. And then, like I said, you've got Sprung, had a career season last year with Seattle, and he can put up goals. He's not to break it level goal scorer, you know, but Sprong can still put up 20, 25 goals, which basically replaces Kubelik, who just who we traded for to bring it. And then you got this third line. I went back and forth who I wanted to have as the, you know, middle six centers, and in which way. And you can really swap these two out, you know, flip each other, and there's really not much of a difference. I just think Kopp is better on the faceoff. And that's why I put him on the two, you know, the second line. But down here, you've got... This is a pretty solid third line, in my opinion. And honestly, it could even potentially be a second line. But I put Fabry, Comfer, and Berggren down here. Now, I wanted to put Berggren up here, but I don't know if Berggren has the ability to keep up with, you know, second line minutes. We've seen what happened last year. The grind of the NHL got to him. Teams were starting to be able to play against him. He's not the biggest guy, although he's bigger than Debrinket, I learned, by quite a bit. Berggren's 5'11". I thought he was like 5'9". Berggren is going to be Detroit's next big playmaker, essentially. Uh, Berggren needs to learn from Perron. I hope during this offseason, Berggren and Perron get together, and Perron, he just absorbs what Perron can do. Because if he can do that, Berggren's going to be a threat. Because Berggren can already do a lot of what Perron does. He can't protect the puck as well due to his size, uh, obviously. But Berggren can. Berggren is an incredible playmaker. His hockey IQ is fantastic, and you can see it when he plays. Things just don't bother him. You know, he 
always has something. He's from what the way he plays, it seems like he's always just looking to make the next play. He doesn't think about you know what if this happens? If I screw this up, this will happen. If I make this wrong call, no, he just sees the best. He looks for the best play possible and he makes it. Then you got Comfer, serviceable center. This is likely where Cop will be in the next few years. And Comfort can play the wing as well. He had like 56 points with Colorado. Hopefully he can, he better be able to put those numbers up for what we're paying him. And, you know, we'll get the, with the contracts and stuff like that that they sign, you know, Comfort, Hall, stuff like that. It's got to be some sort of, it, it's likely some sort of Detroit tax, you know, where you've got to overpay or extend terms on the on certain players during free agency because Detroit's not exactly a desirable place to play. Yes, people want to play for Iserman, but they're not going to play for Iserman if the team that he's, you know, if they're going to a team, the team he's managing is a basement level team, essentially. They're not going to want to go there. So his contract is debatable. But I think if he's able to put up the production that he did with Colorado, then you will be, f- it, it's fine. You know, getting a third line center that puts up half, that's half, over half point per game at five mil, it's basically the same contract, almost the same contract Cop has. So I think if he can put up those numbers again, then everything will be fine. So. Then you got Fabry, and honestly, I, I, sw- I was debating whether or not I put Fabry where Perron's at. My problem there is that Perron has Perron played all 82 games last season, I believe, and he's you know proven to be an excellent playmaker and a valuable member to the top six. But unfortunately, somebody's got to get moved out of the top six, and Fabry, with his injury history, yes, Fabry, when he's healthy, can put up 20 plus goals. I'm almost certain of it. He put up 17 in he put up 17 last season and when he came back when he played for like 20 games or something like that, I think it was even less than that. He was scoring goals. So, you know, Fabry's going to be a half point per game player no matter where you put him, I'm pretty sure. But it was tough because Fabry's still young. He has proven to be able to score goals on a semi-regular basis, which is what you at least what you need from him. I think we've still got like two years on his contract, so it's difficult to say the least of place Fabry. Plus, you don't know what his injury history is going to be like. Thankfully for that, you know we've got some people that we can slot in the lineup. But this is the this is where we get to the fourth line, and this is where I say this lineup is heavily it's heavily put together by assuming certain players are going to make the team. And one of these players is Casper. I didn't want to put Casper down on the fourth line, but you're not going to sign Comfer and, you know, Cop and have them play fourth line minutes making $5 million a year. It's not going to happen. Do I think people should be played based off of what they're play- paid? No. If they're playing like trash, then they play, you know, trash line minutes. So this could be changed. But I believe if Casper makes the team, he will likely be fourth or maybe even third line center. You know, you can always move stuff around. You move Comfer up to here, Sprong down, Casper goes up, put Rasmussen in center. You know, Bergeron goes down to the fourth line. You know, you can make several different moves. You can move people in and out of the lineup as you please. It's definitely going to be like this is a good problem for Detroit to have but if Casper makes the team I don't believe he's playing second or third line minutes right off the bat he's likely going to be playing third fourth line minutes and work his way up the lineup you know he's eventually he's going to be the second line center unless Daniels or you know Danielson will be but that you know, down, that's down the line, and I got to admit, a center lineup looking like Larkin, Danielson, Casper, and then probably Valeno looks good to me. But anyways, so you've got Casper, and this is going to be a pain on the ass line to play against, let me tell you. I've got Casper, Costin, and Rasmussen. All of these guys don't mind starting shit or getting into shit. Costin is actively happy to just punch somebody in the face. So this is going to be a miserable line to play against. 
and I can't think of a better fourth line, really. Like, Casper as your center. Casper's a, go- a really good center. It, I mean, it's one game, it didn't really show, but he was just kind of thrown to the Wolves on the second line, and he was going up against, like, a Marner and Matthews and whatnot. So, it, that's to, to be taken with a grain of salt. It was literally just 60 minutes of the kid. But then you got Rasmussen, who's going to realistically probably be the playmaker of this line. Big... Six foot six power forward essentially. He is learning and has almost pretty much learned how to use his body to play the game. And I believe if he comes in next season, carries over how he played this last season and the second half pretty much of you know the 2020 20 or the 2021 2022 season, Rasmussen is going to be a force on the boards and in front of the net. Then, like I said, you got Costin. Actively happy to punch somebody in the face. Sandpaper player. He's got offensive upside. You know, you don't, ju- you can't just sign people now to c- contracts just because they punch people. You can't do that. You know, it's it, it's the Ryan Reeves effect essentially. People will overvalue somebody like a Ryan Reeves or. A Clem Costin, or you know, just anybody who body who just you know hits people, whether it be with their fists or just you know just laying them the fuck out with a heavy body hit, body check. But the difference between Reeves and Costin is Costin's got some pretty decent offensive upsides. Um, Reeves doesn't. Straight up, Reeves doesn't. He. He just can't play hockey. He's literally just there to be a brute. And that's it. Like, yeah, he scores goals from time to time. But I believe, if I remember correctly, I'm not going to look at the stats now because I don't want to. But if I remember correctly, in his entire career, he has never scored more than, like, 11 goals in a season. And I think in his entire 15-year career, he's only got, I think it's like, I think it's barely 50 goals, something like that. So, I mean, he's been in the league almost, pretty much as long as uh, Crosby and Ovechkin, almost. Like, he's been in the league for a very long time. So, it, it it's, you know, there's a difference between getting a bruiser who can score and a bruiser who's just there to be a bruiser. And Clem Costin is our bruiser who can score. You don't need him to be anything special. You don't need him to be a world burner. He's going to be on the fourth line. You just need him to play his game and play it well. Now, this is where we get into the people who may or may not make the final lineup. You've got Fisher and Valeno. Fisher is a guy. As Brad Crisco on the Wingwheel Podcast said, Fisher is a guy. Uh, I think he only had like six points last season with Arizona, but he's serviceable. Like, yes, you know, throw him on the fourth line and he'll be fine. But then you get to Valeno, who's the biggest question mark on the team right now. Because as far as I know, Valeno has not been re-signed. He's an RFA, which means Detroit can still keep his rights, but he all signs pointed towards him being re-signed and staying as a member of the Wings. And I do still think he's going to be a member of the Red Wings. It's just a matter of this, this contract getting done. And the closer we get to September, it you know, August, September, it's getting a bit worrying that he hasn't signed yet. So my question is, is he asking for more than what he's worth? Is he or is he asking for what he he's at or is he asking for money based off of what he's projecting himself to be or what is he what is going on does he want more term stuff like that so it's interesting but if if Casper doesn't make the lineup without a doubt if Valeno gets re-signed he's going right there Valeno is going to be your fourth line center not bad Valeno is the classic case of the eyes of the eye test doesn't match the stats. You know, his stats do not match the way he played. Because he played really well this season. He just didn't have the numbers to prove it. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. But I do believe 
Casper makes the lineup, and Valeno might be out. Valeno will very likely and very possibly be the healthy scratch, essentially. All right, next we move to defensemen, which is where more things get things get even more fucking convoluted because we signed so many defensemen. We have so many defensive prospects. It's I don't understand why Eisenman went out and signed all all these defensemen. Like I do, but I don't. So starting off first pairing Wallman Cider, which is a great thing, not just because Wallman and Cider were borderline elite. They were a borderline elite pairing by the end of the season. But this means we're not even questioning who the first who the first line D-men are. But last year coming into the season, we were wondering who was going to be the first pairing. And it ended up being Cider Sharat. That didn't work out. Wallman proved himself, moved up to the first line with Cider, worked out beautifully. But this is now assuming Edmondson makes the lineup. And if Edmondson makes the lineup, which he should, who does he get put with? I mean, you could put him with Gobst uh, Ghost of Spare because, you know, Ghost of Spare plays both sides. You know, he has and likes and doesn't mind playing both left and right wing. But if you do that, you run the risk of putting, you, you run the risk of having Schrott and Hull together, which is just a bad train wreck waiting to happen. Like, I, it, having those two together, it, I mean, it could work because Schrott is definitely the wild card offensive defenseman and Hull is definitely the defensive defenseman in that situation. But the problem is, both kind of suck at those jobs. <laughs> like, I, I, and I mentioned this during the, you know, free agency video. Justin Hall is not, I don't think, nearly as bad as Leafs fans made him out to be. You know, the, Toronto being basically the hub of, ho of hockey is, or at least NHL hockey, I should say, ha is basically a, a pressure cooker, and it puts every single player that plays in Canada, especially on in Toronto, under this microscope and if they screw up just once no matter how big or small that screw up is they will cook you for it and Hall became basically public enemy number one for Toronto fans you know and I, not without reason you know there were times where Hall's blunders and mental lapses essentially cost you know Toronto games so it, it it's not without merit but I do think Hull is better than it, what Toronto, you know, Toronto fans and media give him credit for. And I think coming to Detroit will help him with those mental lapses a bit. But I don't know if, I mean, if we knew what causes them, is it a confidence thing? Which it shouldn't be because, you know, dude's been in the league for a little bit now. Or is it, a, or is it just a skill thing or what? I don't know what it is. But the point is, you cannot have Sherratt and Hall on the same line, which sucks because Ghost of Spare would likely be on the second line with Edvinson. He would likely be the second pair de second pair demon with Edvinson. And if we didn't sign Hall, then likely Mata would be there with him, which I'm fine with. You know, it's I, I'm fine with Mata being. And he still could be, realistically. There is a potential that Edmondson doesn't make the team. He really should make the team. But there is a slight potential that he doesn't. And it's kind of backed up by all these defensive signings because, I mean, Detroit re-signed Gustav Lindstrom, too. So what do you do there? Like, I it's and I bring up the Wheel podcast because I listen to him a lot, and Brad Krishko makes some really good points. It would have been better to just not sign Hull. Like... I understand why we signed him. I understand why we need him. But it would have been high, uh, easier to just not sign Hall, put Mata in the lineup, and keep Edmondson, or keep Edmund, put Edmondson in there, and keep Lindstrom as your seventh pair D. It's that that would have been the smartest play. But, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We all understand why Eisenman made the move he did. And, and I don't think Hall is worth what his contract is, but like I said, Detroit tax essentially. You've got to likely play payers more or give them more contract term for them to want to come and play in Detroit because Detroit's not a winning team. It's just, I don't... It, it, all of these signings, like I said, lead quite, leave questions with what's going to happen with our prospects because there is such things over opening prospects. So we as Detroit fans have seen it through the Holland era. You know, I believe Zadina is a victim of 
Holland just not opening that door to prospects. And because Holland shut the door on prospects so often, you know, anytime a prospect, there were prospects banging on the door, just waiting to get out. And Holland shut the door on them and then signed Franz Nielsen to like a six year deal. So there is such things over ripening prospects. You know, you don't want, you want them to get used to the NHL professional pace. So you put them in the AHL, you know, you throw them in Grand Rapids, let them get used to that. If they can get used to that, okay, then you've got a shot at making, then you're likely got a good shot at making the roster. And you can't bring all of them up at once, obviously. You know, you can't show, you can't come and bring, you know, Casper, Mazur, and Edmondson all in at once because, well, then that's just an inexperienced team. So you've got to bring them up in waves. And likely, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind them bringing both Casper and Edmondson up. Because Edvinson's played nine games in the NHL. You know, he was a call-up for when, I think it was, uh, like, Lindstrom or Hag or someone got injured. So they brought him up. He played with Mata. It was when Schrock got injured, I think. Yeah, when Schrock got injured, you know, they brought him up. He played with Mata. Then you had a Hag and Lindstrom there. So it's... He looked good, you know. It, I, there's some concerns about his pace, but the pace has never been part of his game. So as long as he can, he does what he does, and plays his game, he should be fine. But like I said, that raises the question: Where does Mata fit in in all this? You don't sign Mata to a you know two year contract extension, and not and you know just keep him as your seventh one, seventh pair of D. You know, you don't do that because that means you're going to have to sit somebody. Who are you going to sit whole? You're not going to sit whole because you just signed him to a three mil three year contract. You can't sit ghost to spare because he's likely going to be your power, your first line power play quarterback. Maybe sit Sherratt, but then you're benching a five mil or like a four mil plus player. If Evanson makes it, you can't, I don't want you to bench, you shouldn't bench Evanson because he needs those games and he needs to play. And you're obviously not going to bench Walman or Cider, so it, it it leaves questions, questions that just you know don't have answers yet. We won't, and won't have answers until you know preseason and the regular season happen. So it, I mean, putting Mata there and bringing Anderson to the lineup makes sense, but at the same time, Mata has this way of elevating everybody he plays with. So do you want to sit? At, do you want to sit Mata? And have Schrott and Hull in the line. You know, it's a it's a very odd situation. But I'm sure Lalonde and Iserman and everyone's going to figure it out. And then next we move on to the goalies. And this goalie this goalie setup is interesting. Because you got Huso. Huso showed incredible fla- flashes of just godliness, alright? Flashes of just being a goaltending god last season. But the grind got to him. He's never played that many games before. You know, he was thrown in around the end of the season for St. Louis just to get them into the playoffs last season. But then he kind of aided in the playoff. He played fantastically then, but then he kind of dropped off in the playoffs. So then Bennington came in, and then they got eliminated in the second round. But you've got Huso, Reimer, and Lyon. Now, what I... This is interesting because it causes competition behind Huso, right? And competition breeds greatness. So, Huso is going to be your starter. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Huso is going to be your starter. But Reimer brings that experience. Reimer's been around the block a lot. He's 35, yes, he's 35 years old. At, but he, and he had a really down year last season. Uh, I think he had like a 890 save percentage. So, yes, he fell. But at his best, he's plus 900 as well. So he was like nine nine twelve, which is fantastic for a backup. But then you've got Alex Lyon, who yes, it's a smaller sample size than Reimer and Huso, obviously, but he is pretty much the reason that Florida got into the playoffs. You know, Knight got injured, so they brought up Lyon, and Lyon played fantastically. Yes, he fell off in the playoffs, and Bobrovsky came in and saved the day essentially up until. He couldn't in the play in the finals, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about Lion, and Lion is fantastic. My money is that he's going to be the third pairing. 
you know, he's basically going to be the third pair goaltender. But that's not a bad thing. That just means both Huso and Reimer have to work to keep their spots. They have to keep being good. And I don't have very many doubts that Huso will continue to be good. You know, he's even in St. Louis, he never showed that during the regular season he would wane. Reimer is, like I said, older and didn't have a very good year last season, but he was also behind a god-awful San Jose team whose best defenseman is Eric Carlson, who is basically a forward posing as a defenseman. So he, there's the potentials there, obviously. We've only got him for a year, so if need be, you put Lyon up there. If Reimer's just not cutting it, you switch him with Lyon. And Lyon, while, yes, small sample size has proven that he's at least Huso count. So it's going to. I, I think our goalie situation is at least pretty. Whoops, is pretty figured out for the last, for the next uh, few seasons, and or not next few seasons, but at least for the next season. Uh, Alex Lyons on a two-year deal, I believe. So worst comes to worst, like I said, Reimer doesn't work out this year. You make Huso and Lyon your tandem. Go out, get another third uh, goaltender, or just keep those two and. Use Kosa, call up Kosa when need be, or Lethman. They just re-signed John Lethman, who I really like. He was na- He was a uh, like goaltender of the year in the ECHL Toledo. So there's plenty of potential there. And looking at this lineup, like I said, basing it heavily on if Casper and Edvinson make the lineup. If they don't, you know, things become, like I said, things become easier if Edson doesn't make it. But Ghost, put Ghost of up with Sherratt, Mata with Hull, and you're basically fine there. Casper doesn't make it. All right, well, then you put Valeno in the 4C, and you pretty much that's how that works. So it's going to be an interesting season. I do believe with this lineup, Detroit is better. You know, is it much better? That's, yeah, you know, to be determined. But I believe if this first line of Larkin, Raymond, Debrinkit can keep up with other teams' first lines, all you need is guys like is these bottom, these you know, bottom nine guys to just come at teams in waves. You know, basically the Seattle effect. Because this Detroit team is one first line and three third lines. Last year it was one first line, one third line, and two fourth lines essentially. So you've got you ba- you've just got to keep going at them in waves. And honestly, this second line could compete, can and will likely compete with other teams' second lines pretty decently. It's just there's not a lot of goal scoring still. Yes, the Brinkett comes in and he adds another thirty, basically thirty goal scoring, you know, thirty goal scoring guy. Raymond, if he breaks out like he should, another 30-goal scorer right there. Second line, pretty much all have play per game, guys. You know, if your top line can be close, if not exactly a point per game or over a point per game, which Debrinkin and Larkin realistically should be, maybe even Raymond, but I don't expect that from him. I expect Raymond 60, 70 points. Larkin and Debrinkin should realistically be over or at least at a point per game this se- this upcoming season. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that Detroit makes the playoffs. But I don't want I want to I want to put this out there don't freak out if they don't because there's they are almost certainly going to compete later into the season than they did last year. Which says a lot because last season they were knocked out of the playoffs in March. March or April. I believe it was April. Now, you know, we can get closer we're getting closer to the playoffs, essentially. And like I said, like I've said before, everyone's saying the division's going to flip. You know, Boston's going to fall off eventually. I don't think it's going to be this upcoming season. But Boston's eventually going to fall off. Tampa is already starting to fall off. Like, I think they were the only team in the playoffs this year that didn't hit over 100 points. I think they were at 98. And plus, they're getting older. So, by the time the division flips, Detroit will be there. And it's not out of the realm of possibility they make it there. We've got, you know, and we've, we've got playoff tested players. You know, you've got Klim Costin, Robbie Fabry, David Prawn. I believe Kopp was in the playoffs at one point. Comfort, Sprong, Sherratt, Hull, Ghost of Spare, Huso, technically, Reimer, Lyon, Mata, 
they we we've got playoff tested guys, so it's going to be interesting to see. But I want to know what you guys think and how you think this lineup's going to shape up. Do you think Edvinson and Casper make it? Do you think just Edvinson make it makes it? Just Casper makes it, or none of them make it? Do you think you know they put Trot and Hull on the same line? Do you think Reimer gets that backup spot, or do you think Alex Lyon pushes him out of it? You know, do you think Valeno resigns? There's lots of questions here, but I want to hear all of your guys' answers in the comments, on Twitter, everywhere, you know? I don't mind. I don't care. I just care about your answers. I don't care. That came out wrong. I care about your answers, but I don't care if you give me them, if that makes sense. Like, I will take, I, I mean, I'll read them and, you know, listen to your point of view, and I want your answers, but if you don't make your answers or give me your answers, I don't care if you don't or do. That's, I'm just digging a deeper hole for myself. But yes, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is The Mexinadian, and I'll talk to you guys later. Adios.